Our program today is especially timely with the inauguration of Barack Obama as the 44th President of the United States. Our event is entitled Assessing the Bush Presidency and the Obama Promises. And we're delighted to have with us here three excellent speakers, Dr. Ivan Eland, Senior Fellow at the Independent Institute and author of the new book which we're featuring tonight called Recarving Rushmore, Ranking the Presidents on Peace, Prosperity, and Liberty. In addition, we're very pleased to have Congressman Ron Paul, former candidate for the United States Office of President. He's just started his 11th term as U.S. Congressman. And the historian Richard Shankman, who's editor of the History News Network and the author of many books. To provide some background, the Independent Institute is a nonprofit scholarly public policy research institute. We sponsor many in-depth studies of social and economic issues, and we publish the result as books, uh, as well as our journal, The Independent Review, and this is the current issue. And for those of you who are with us here, there are complimentary copies downstairs, and you're welcome to take one. We'd also invite you and our viewers at C-SPAN to visit us at our website, which is independent.org. You'll find information about our publications, conferences, media, and other projects. You'll also find information about our blog, which is called The Beacon, which I think you'll find quite intriguing, as well as our newsletter, our email newsletter at The Lighthouse, and you can sign up for a free subscription on the web, on the homepage of our website. America's first president, George Washington, noted that, quote, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, a troublesome servant and a fearful master, never for a moment should it be left to irresponsible action, unquote. As you know, the subject of our event today is the use of power by American presidents. The U.S. presidency is by far the most powerful position in the world. Indeed, the U.S. government is almost entirely the presidency. The budgets of the Congress and the Supreme Court are virtually inconsequential compared to that of the executive branch. The presidency, after all, includes all of the departments of the federal government, including Treasury, Commerce, and Defense, the IRS, CIA, NSA, NASA, and the FBI, all of the U.S.'s nuclear and other weapons, spy satellites, aircraft carriers, ICBM missiles, hundreds of military bases worldwide, and huge tracts of federal lands, minerals, highways, and waterways. All of the regulatory agencies, the FTC, the FDA, the SEC, OSHA, EPA, and the list just goes on. But to be put so pervasive and so powerful, the presidency is far, far more. For most Americans, the presidency has become a sort of sovereign king and father figure who stands above and beyond mere citizens in order to oversee our lives and our well-being. As such, the presidency is really sort of a secular religious figure, sort of an earthly messiah, who many believe will save them from all forms of harm by wielding government power against others. As a result, around the presidency has grown a cult of power and personality, not unlike in many respects what we find in the history of rulers of the past. The spectacle and circus of the presidential inauguration is really only the beginning of what we all witness day in and day out in the media, and popular culture of the cultural trappings of presidential glorification and worship. But what exactly is it they're worshiping? Stripped of the superficial pomp and vanity of some, what do you really have? Doesn't each president, after all, take an oath to preserve and protect the Constitution and its limits on executive power? So how did George W. Bush and his president predecessors stack up in holding this pledge? Have they increased or decreased peace, prosperity, and liberty, as Dr. Elin's book subtitle is considering? And have they upheld the, the Constitution in the process? Was Lord Acton correct in counseling and the founders correct in being mindful of? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupt, tends to corrupt absolutely. Ivan Elin is senior fellow and director of the, of the Center of, on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute. Dr. Ely received his master's degree in applied economics and his PhD in public policy from George Washington University. He earlier spent 15 years working for Congress on budget and national security issues 
including the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the Congressional Budget Office, and the Government Accountability Office, and he has testified before many committees in the House and Senate. His articles have appeared in, in uh, major newspapers and magazines across the country, and he's the author of many books, including the one that we're featuring today, Recarving Rushmore. I'm very delighted to introduce Ivan Elam. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate the nice crowd here. Uh, I have a hunch some of you are coming to see congressmen here, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll get a few, uh, I'll get a few uh, sentences in before that. Um, now, the reason I wrote this book, uh, Recarving Rushmore, was because uh, I felt that the way historians, political scientists, journalists, and even the public evaluated presidential success was off kilter. I didn't go around uh, in uh, uh, musty archives trying to unearth starting, startling new historical information about this president or that president. What I did was I took existing sources and I just uh, tried to th think about it in a different way. Uh, re that is, reanalyze it from a different perspective. Now, although the book is about the presidents, it is really an alternative history of the United States. So I thought tonight, you know, we all in Washington, we go to uh, uh, lectures and we hear the speaker speak and then we all get up and ask questions. I thought it would be interesting if I asked the audience some questions first, uh, kind of reversing the role here. Um, so I'm going to... Um, I'll give you a little quiz. I'm going to take a baseline first, and I'll get into the presidents. I have some uh, questions first. The first one is, uh, what happened on July 4th, 1776? Does anybody ha want to hazard a guess? I don't hear any. Oh, guess you didn't learn that in school. Huh? <laughs> anybody have a guess? Okay. Okay. Question number two. Um, who uh, did the first powered, controlled flight? Anybody got any ideas? Okay. And uh, who was the first person to fly across the Atlantic? Lindbergh. Okay. Now, when I was in when I was in college, I went. To, I did. Uh, I volunteered for psychological experiments. And when you go in, they basically trick you because they think you think you're doing one thing and you're really doing another thing. I, that wasn't the baseline. That was the quiz, and you all flunked because those answers unbelievably are wrong. The Declaration of Independence was not signed on July 4th. Uh, the, the vote for independence was on July 2nd. Nothing major really happened on July 4th. And John Adams said that uh, he wrote that July 2nd would always be our Independence Day. Well, he was wrong. Uh, okay, now I'm going to go through these quick because I really do want to get on to the presence, but I have a point in doing this. Okay, the first, the second one, what was my second question? Oh yeah, the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers were not the first um, people to fly under controlled powered flight. There was a guy named uh, Gustav Whitehead who did it two years before and while the Wright brothers were getting a few hundred yards, 832 yards I think, or 800 and some yards in their plane, he took a flight seven miles and he did it two years before the Wright brothers and the, di the reason that he didn't get the fame, there were two reasons. The first one, nobody took a photograph. The famous photograph got in all the school kids history books and the Smithsonian for years refused, uh, well, they wanted the Wright Brothers plane because it became so famous, but they refused to put uh, the fathers of flight because they knew it wasn't really true until the family said, well, you're not getting the plane unless you put that on there, so they did. But, but and the second reason he, he didn't get any credit was because he was a German immigrant, and if you recall, we were leading up to World War I at the time, and German uh, immigrants uh, were not too, fond, uh, too fondly regarded at the time. Okay, the third one, Charles Lindbergh. He was probably the 82nd person to fly across the Atlantic. Uh, now, I'm not kidding, um, but it's hard to say because there were various crews and various aircraft that did it, but he was not the first. Uh, many more people did it. The reason he became famous is because uh, people in Paris listened to all the tribulations that he had on his trip, and so they all rushed out to the field, and he was really shocked when he landed at all these people. He, he had made such a, were making such a, uh, an issue of the, that he landed, and they picked him up and carried, around, carried him around. And of course, he became famous. But of course, now the reason I mention these three events is not because they have it to do anything to do with presidents. It's because what you think you read in, history, in your history books in high school and college may not be true, and then 
uh, some of the stuff that is true, they've left out some things. So I just want you to think about that while I go into this, because my ratings of presidents are much different than the uh, uh, ratings of conservatives and liberals, which, although there are some differences, they seem to be uh, coalescing around uh, uh, some agreement, actually, on those, um, even on presidents like Reagan. But um, it's not really because uh, that I think they're right. Uh, the, everyone thought the world was flat until they figured out it wasn't. Some guy did it, and he's figured out it wasn't, right? So then, so groupthink is not necessarily correct. And I believe that both parties uh, now, and, and both the left and the right in the United States, have the bias of they like activist big government, both at home and abroad, uh, with noted exceptions uh, <laughs> sitting to my left. Um, so I, so I wrote this book saying, well, let's, let's just look at the policies. Let's not look at charisma, uh, which many historians, they, they wouldn't consciously say they fall victim to charisma, but they, they take it into account, I think. Uh, otherwise, uh, why would Teddy Roosevelt get so much play? Um, William McKinley, his predecessor, was a much more important president than uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, they also uh, lo love activism. Uh, an active president who's bold and that sort of thing. But is that always the way to, to the right policy? Uh, David was just talking about how the presidency has, has gone uh, uh, into an imperial mode and maybe now with Bush even into a hyper-imperial mode. Uh, is this the way we want to go? What about the, uh, the way the founders uh, envisioned the system was that the Congress would be the uh, primary uh, first among equals in the government. Uh, Article 1 is not the the executive branch is the congressional branch. Um, the, the Constitution specifies in great deal what the Congress's powers were in, the, in Article II. It's very vague. And of course, unfortunately, the presidents have filled that void with many actions that were probably unconstitutional. So now, I uh, try to get rid of the charisma bias. I try to get rid of the um, activism bias. Uh, we like presidents who can give a great speech. We, you know, we have all heard uh, um, speeches by Roosevelt and Kennedy, who I don't think were that good of presidents. Uh, maybe we can go into that later. But uh, we love presidents who can turn a good phrase, or at least their speech writers like Theo Sorensen can turn a good phrase, and the, and the president can deliver the speech in a good way. Uh, and lastly, uh, historians are biased because uh, they love presidents who serve in a war or during a crisis. Even if the president contributed to the crisis, didn't prevent the crisis, made it worse, or caused the crisis in the first place. Uh, and we have many instances of that in American history, I think. Now, my problem with some of the other analysis is that they assume the posture of the net neutral observer. And none of this is neutral because everyone looks back on history with their current policy views. I'm no different, but I'll tell you what my policy views are. Uh, you have to dig around to figure out what the other policy views of, of other people are. Uh, not everyone, but one, an example of this is they use the effectiveness criterion. Now, I, I term it presidential success, not effectiveness, because I want to focus on not whether the president was able to uh, implement his agenda uh, and how effective he was doing that. Because if you take that to the extreme, if Lenin, Stalin, and Mao were presidents of the United States, they would have been very effective. They should be one, two, and three, right? They did what they wanted to do. So of course, policy does matter. Policy, what they do does matter. And I say that that's what we ought to concentrate on. Uh, it doesn't matter that uh, uh, Bush is not a good orator or he can't put a sentence together. Probably doesn't matter. Uh, the policy. The policy is what matters, and uh, uh, that's what we need to concentrate on. And I think uh, we haven't really done that very well, uh, and I try to do that. So um, I've no I noted all these biases, and so I basically, um, what, how did I evaluate the presidents? I evaluated them on the basis of whether they upheld the Constitution, meaning a limited role for the presidency. I also evaluated them on whether their policies promoted peace, prosperity, and liberty. Uh, and I think we can all agree on those goals, but how do we get there, right? Uh, well, in my view, um, a limited, uh, read small government 
with a restrained executive and a Congress that was first among equals compared to the other two branches is the ideal. That's a republic. Uh, and we saw what happened to Rome as, as power went from the uh, assembly to the Senate, uh, to the dictator, to the emperor. And I'm afraid uh, we're on the slow road to that. And uh, um, it's sort of like the frog who jumps in the bathtub uh, because it's not cold and they gradually um, um, put up the temperature of the water uh, so that he doesn't know it and eventually he's dead. And unfortunately, we don't have the dictators that just come in and take power. Over, over time, through US history, the president has accrued more and more power. Now, the Congress, uh, or I mean the founders, uh, initially uh, wanted the system to be that the Congress dominated and the states dominated. Well, now we have a system where the president and the Supreme Court dominate with the president of the strongest of those two players. So I, I say that we don't really have the government that we all celebrate on uh, Independence Day, even though it's uh, the Declaration of Independence that we're supposedly uh, celebrating, which wasn't even signed on that day. But uh, um, so we're cel we're, we have this idealized vision of what we're celebrating, and it, it really isn't it doesn't correspond with modern day uh, the modern day government. Um, now you say, well, we have a government that you can change the Constitution. Well, I have no problem if people amend the Constitution, even if I don't agree with the amendment. But they've made the Constitution so hard to amend that people have just uh, uh, amended it without amending it, and that means. Uh, that it's a living constitution. And I have a problem with that because that undermines the rule of law. So basically, I evaluated each president whether on the margins they took us away or toward the founder's original vision of small government, which I believe is the best route. And, uh, and uh, on the road to a small government, a constrained chief executive and restrained foreign policy, which the founders also advocated, which of course both parties have moved way away from. So. A president who served in time of big government who tried to reduce it, like Car J Jimmy Carter and uh, Dwight Eisenhower, get a, get a better rating than presidents who served in a time of small government and increased it. Uh, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Monroe. Now, a word on po po uh, political party affiliate, affiliation. Uh, evaluating according to my criteria, the Democrats seem to have the best presidents, but also the worst presidents, and the Republicans seem to have some somewhere in the middle, and that probably goes for modern presidents, because party is a very bad um, indicator. If you look at the, and I think this is a good statistic to use, gover government as a percentage of GDP, you'll find some astounding things. You'll find that Reagan wasn't a small government. Uh, person. He doubled the size of the federal government. And he, LBJ, Nixon, Reagan, and the, bo the current president are the biggest spenders as, a, as uh, if you use the, uh, the change in GDP, uh, change in federal, uh, federal spending as a portion of GDP, which is astounding. And the two presidents that reduced it the most were Clinton and Carter. Uh, Eisenhower was, came in third. He basically held uh, the uh, percentage uh, roughly constant. So that's just one indicator of how things are kind of topsy-turvy. Uh, of course, also the parties have changed position over time. Until Woodrow Wilson, Democrats were for small government and Republicans were for big government. Then, after Woodrow Wilson, the Democrats joined the Republicans in the big government camp. Uh, President Company accepted. Uh, <laughs> He was never in the big government camp. Uh, so, pre, and pre-McKinley, uh, both parties advocated a, a restrained foreign policy. That was a traditional foreign policy of the United States, meaning limit your uh, interventions uh, militarily overseas. Now, of course, both parties are interventionists abroad. They have different versions of it, uh, but, the, but they're still in agreement on it. Um, and the third uh, thing about parties is that sometimes it's easier to go against your party to achieve big success. Nixon went to China, Clinton uh, did welfare reform and free trade, and uh, John Tyler, who incidentally uh, is a very obscure president, but I think was the best president in US history, was almost impeached by his own party uh, uh, sticking up for small government because he, he was a Whig, and Whigs were, were for big government. They were the precursor to the Republican Party. And uh, he almost got impeached uh, by, by his own party. Um, 
So I think most analysts, both liberal and conservative, are evaluating presidents with a hidden bias toward big government at home and abroad and a powerful chief executive. And to show you how presidents' uh, reputations will change over time, uh, Woodrow Wilson, after World War I, was roundly reviled uh, uh, for having gotten us into that war because there was a lot of carnage. People weren't used to uh, deaths uh, on that scale. And uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson had said we were going to, uh, into World War I uh, because of all these idealistic reasons. And it turns out that uh, secret agreement, when the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, they uh, published all these secret treaties, which indicated that our allies, Britain and France, were really uh, making deals so they could expand their empires. So uh, back then, he was reviled. Well, of course, now he's fairly well regarded because everyone has adopted the Wilsonian foreign policy of intervention. And so he has been rehabilitated. Uh, and so. Uh, this is a, an example of how we view uh, history through the present day. Um, so I ranked Wilson the 40th of 40 presidents because basically he ruined the entire 20th century and he's currently working on ruining this one. And he's been long dead. And, and the reason he did that, of course, was because uh, many of the things he did uh, helped bring Hitler to power. He didn't directly bring Hitler to power, but of course he let the Allies uh, run all over Germany, and he also uh, demanded the abdication of the Kaiser, and of course that opened the way toward Hitler's power, uh, get, getting to power. And of course, uh, also he he uh, offered aid to the provisional government in uh, Russia, and tried to keep it in World War One. Uh, well, of course, World War One was even more unpopular in Russia since they had mass casualties. Uh, and so, of course, the Bolsheviks were the only anti-war party. They came to power, and of course, uh, the rest is history there. Now, similarly, Tr Harry Truman ended his presidency with Bush-like popularity numbers, which isn't good. Um, and he didn't run for another term because the, unpop the Korean War was so unpopular. Uh, but Truman does give Bush hope because uh, his interventionist template for fighting the Cold War was adopted by every post-World -war, War II president uh, until the East Bloc and the USSR collapsed. So, of course, Truman has been rehabilitated, um, and uh, bookending the Cold War was Reagan, the last president to serve any length of time before the Berlin Wall fell, and he has become an icon because that happened. Um, so, um, we have, uh, we, of course, we could have uh, had an alternative policy in the Cold War, and that is to um, let the Soviet Union have South Korea, Vietnam, Angola, Afghanistan, and these other uh, countries with no GDP. Let them administer them. Let them ex uh, take the expenses for aid, et cetera. So there are alternative policies that could be followed. Uh, and I go into that in the book with various things, especially Lincoln. I think we could have avoided, a, uh, we could have freed the slaves by avoiding a war that killed 600,000 Americans and is still the worst war we've ever had. So um, you don't have to be a southern, a closet southern sympathizer to criticize Lincoln for that, I think, uh, because the policy, alternative policies can be found. So uh, I'll, this brings me to Bush, and then I'll quit here. Um, Bush is hoping for a Truman-like resurrection from the ash heap of bad presidents. I think it's possible that he could actually be, but probably less likely than in Truman's case, because although Truman uh, had, a, had the communists, uh, which, were eventually, uh, which eventually fell because of their own dysfunctional system, uh, to bring him back. Uh, Bush, even if, even if Osama bin Laden is caught or captured or killed, somebody will just say, well, gee, Bush spent seven years trying to get this guy, and the next guy got him, or maybe the next guy, who knows. But uh, I also think Bush will be blamed for the economic meltdown. Uh, they'll probably fail to realize that Bush was less conservative than Clinton in many areas, such as trade and, fisc and, and in fiscal matters. Um, and I already mentioned Bush profligate spending, and uh, I'm not sure uh, how that will, that will turn out. But uh, Bush's presidency, he likes to compare himself to Ronald Reagan, but I would say his presidency most closely parallels LBJ's, guns and butter. 
Uh, of course, the butter, uh, the flavor of the butter is a little different, but the butter is still there. Um, now, there's no way the historians will put lipstick on a pig and have different evaluation of the Hurricane Katrina response. I think, you know, that's, there's no way he can re rehabilitate, him, uh, sell, rehabilitate himself from that one. Um, and I think somebody's going to ask why it did take so long to, to get Osama bin Laden, and did we go off on other uh, tangents, uh, nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan while, while uh, Osama bin Laden was in Pakistan. Um, of course, Bush can claim that there were no further major attacks on the U.S. soil after 9-11, but of course, uh, terrorist attacks on U.S. soil have traditionally been rare. Uh, anyway, we've been a haven against terrorism here because of the distances involved. And of course, uh, so the astute historian would ask, well, how many attacks did we have before this, uh, before 9-11? Uh, the other thing is, what about 9-11? Uh, Bush uh, has been criticized for ignoring warning signs uh, leading up to the attack. Um, so I'm not sure he's going to come out uh, um, very well on that. And he was sort of baited by Osama bin Laden to overreact as most guerrillas and terrorists uh, try to get the, 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 uh, the formidable power to do. And of course, he went into two Muslim lands and that's, of course, what drives Islamists crazy, is non-Muslim forces on Muslim land. So, of course, Osama bin Laden, uh, Bush did, right, did exactly what he wanted to. Also, even if Iraq becomes a democracy, uh, the, the, back, in the, back in the Spanish American War days, uh, the Philippines eventually became a democracy, but uh, I don't think historians have changed their opinion that the Spanish American War was an, war was an embarrassing colonial conflict, uh, which uh, resulted in the deaths of 200,000 Filipinos, um, which you don't hear very much in your, which, <clears throat> excuse me, probably wasn't in your high school or college textbook either. Um, uh, but but it's, I, to me, it's uh, doubtful whether democracy will hold in Iraq. I think there probably will be a conflict uh, when the U.S. leaves, so I don't think that's over with yet. And, of course, Afghanistan is probably a tougher nut to crack than um, um, Iraq. Now, Bush's worst transgression is his usurpation of presidential power uh, uh, turning the imperial presidency into the hyper-imperial presidency. His, tra his transgressions include eliminating habeas corpus, illegal and unconstitutional warrantless wiretapping, torture, and kangaroo military tribunals. But alas, if you arch liberals in the audience, if there are any here, I did not rate Bush the worst president ever. And the reason that I didn't was because there are other presidents who've started wars for even more questionable reasons, or uh, presidents who started wars um, for, and had much greater implications. Now, why do I focus on the wars? My book says peace, prosperity, and liberty. I think peace is the most important one of those. And I think conservatives should listen up here because a lot of conservatives um, are, are really neoconservatives and they don't know it. Because ever since William F. Buckley in the 50s, uh, conservative has been, has, conservatism has been defined, at least the mainstream conservatism, um, uh, present company again accepted, uh, uh, on the basis of, well, we, in, in the 50s it was, we fight the Soviet Union and if we're going to get some big government, so we better take that too. Uh, but we'll, take, we'll try to reduce it as much as we can. But the, so, the central uh, uh, um, thrust is to fight the communists. Well, of course, um, um, you know, we, we, we still have this uh, bias, I think, and uh, we, we've got the, we've got the um, so of course, Bush is, uh, is neoconservative is the extreme uh, portion of this, but uh, Bush is, is I think he, in his own mind, he probably had some legitimate reasons for uh, invading Iraq. I'm not sure they were correct. Uh, James Polk, on the other hand, invaded Mexico, grabbed half its land, and then, of course, lied about it to Congress. Uh, so if that's similar, yes, it is. But I think Polk's is probably a worse transgression because he was just out after the territory. And there, was no, uh, there was no dressing it up. Um, William McKinley, I rated below him because he started the Spanish-American War, which of course had tremendous implications for our foreign policy. It was our first uh, colonial war, 
and it, was, uh, it started us on the road to what I call an informal empire. And also, McKinley was the first modern president. Whenever we say modern, we mean excess power excess in, in excess of the Constitution. Uh, of course, there were pres other presidents before that that did that, but McKinley uh, it was the first uh, uh, president of the, of the 20th century, and he uh, certainly consolidated power as a result of the, the um, uh, Spanish-American War. He was a much more important president than Teddy Roosevelt, who was much more charismatic. I rated Truman uh, next to the last because he chose to fight an interventionist Cold War, and I think he could have done it in a more Republican fashion. He, uh, his policies led to the first uh, permanent standing army in the history of the United States. We, we were, the founders were tremendously against that, and it, we, it endured uh, for a long time, and it was only in the 50s that that happened, which is amazing. But uh, he was responsible for that, and of course, uh, um, he was also responsible for the imperial presidency. Uh, inst uh, uh, creating the institutions of the imperial presidency. And of course, Wilson, I've already gone into Wilson. He's my last uh, president, and I already explained that. that. So um, I will, I've only done the worst ones because those are the most interesting. Uh, in the question and answer, we might be able to get to the best ones. Thank you, Ivan. Um, his book is full of surprises, and uh, uh, it is one that's been heavily recommended by historians and other scholars, and uh, so I hope that each of you will take a look at it. I think you'll find it quite rewarding. I'm especially delighted to introduce our next speaker. Ron Paul is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, as you all well know, a two-time presidential candidate, He's clearly the leading spokesman in Washington for limited government, low taxes, free markets, a non-interventionist foreign policy, and a return to sound monetary policies based on a commodity-backed currency. He graduated from Gettysburg College and Duke University School of Medicine before serving as a flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force during the 1960s, and then as a specialist in obstetrics gynecology in private medical practice. Congressman Paul has been a member of the House Financial Service Committee, the International Relations Committee, and the Joint Economic Committee. He's the author of numerous books, including most recently the number one best-selling book, Revolution and Manifesto. Congressman Paul is renowned for his principal voting record and his critique of the abuse of presidential power. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. David, thank you for the invitation. And Ivan, congratulations on your book. It's wonderful. But it is nice to be here to visit about a subject that is very, very important. But I want to assure you that uh, you should rest comfortably because yesterday we all at the Congress took our oath of office and everybody did it very seriously and they held up their right hand and they swore to uphold the Constitution. So I guess we're all okay. <laughs> But the amazing thing is they were all very serious. And the other amazing thing is they actually believe they do. It's just their interpretation versus our interpretation, and sometimes, and sometimes they're different. But, <laughs> but, the, uh, but you, you know, uh, when I was running last year uh, for the presidency, um, my, my staff told me we had a couple things, a couple problems to deal with. Uh, more than a couple, but uh, the one was that the record for those individuals who came from Texas and became president, they weren't all that great, and they said they're not ready for another Texan to be president. <laughs> when you think about two Bushes and, and uh, LBJ, I mean, they weren't exactly the greatest presidents in the world. But uh, the other thing is, is I had this habit of telling people I really didn't want to be president. I mean, I have no desire to, uh, under the, today's conditions. And that uh, the only reason I want to be president, if I'm to be the president, is that it's because of the things I don't want to do. I don't want to run your life. I don't want to run the economy. And I don't want to run the world. And uh, they... Uh, <laughs> 
They say, well, no, you, you have to be sort of more positive about this thing. I say, okay, how about, how about uh, peace and, and freedom and, uh, and prosperity? Those are pretty good. Those are positive things that we, we should be running on. But uh, Ivan mentioned the things about sometimes we are deceived into believing some things and they're not, uh, and, and they're not really, uh, really true. And, and that is so often the case. Uh, but I think a lot of people in Congress and presidents, everybody up and down, uh, deceive themselves. I, I think that so often is, uh, is the problem. Right now, I think when uh, members of Congress and even the president takes the oath of office about uh, defending this country and the Constitution against all enemies, uh, foreign and domestic, very few of them think are any enemies domestic. All of all the enemies are those foreigners, you know, whether it's the foreigners who uh, are always attacking us and we have to be prepared and have to have this military uh, machine. Also, it's the foreigners who want to come here. You know, they're always our enemies that we have to uh, have to deal with. It's hardly those individuals that are undermining our liberties over here on the Hill. But I can tell you in the last year or two, I've uh, visiting a lot of people, and uh, by far and large, the uh, people who came to the rallies were young people. Uh, when I used, uh, when I would emphasize this foreign and, and I would pause and, I said domestic, and it got some pretty loud, loud applauses. So I think there are people starting to wake up and, and uh, re realizing the difference. You know, I, I do believe this is a true story about Harry Truman. Uh, he can hardly be one of our favorite presidents, uh, but uh, I, I believe it was true that when he left here, you know, he walked down to the railroad station and got on a train and went home. Now, that's great symbolism. I wished it were that simple again. Uh, but what is the symbolism that we have today of the presidency? Is it bad as it was then? Is it as bad as it's been throughout the 20th century, basically? Uh, the, uh, the symbolism is that uh, Obama now has his Air Force One. He's not even sworn in. He's flying around the country and wherever he wants to go, and uh, it's the uh, Air Force One substitute, but it's essentially the same plane. So uh, this this shows how much we, how far we have come to sort of bowing to the presidency. I guess the most astounding thing about how much power we have given the president is the um, willingness of Congress. The many Congresses that we've had in the last hundred years or so, their willingness not only to just step, step back and let the president do whatever he wants, but so often they pass legislation and they give him the authority. I mean, they, they pass it on and give the president the authority to do what he wants. The, the resolution to go to war against Iraq uh, was literally amending the Constitution. It didn't tell the president to go to war. It didn't tell the president not to go to war. Uh, it told the president, whatever he wants to do, he can do that. And some of them said, well, this is pretty good because if he gets into trouble, then it won't be our fault. You know, they don't want to assume the responsibility for it. On trade agreements, uh, the, the, the Congress is in charge of trade agreements. And, uh, and uh, if, if you, you can either do it directly and pass in laws, and do tariffs, or you could have uh, you could you, you could have treaties, and you could have uh, the Senate uh, approve treaties. But it's not done that way. We have uh, fast track legislation. We just give the power to the president to negotiate all these deals, and the, and the Congress never says a word. They they just give it up. So the um, the Congress uh, yields uh, so much power to the president, both by just omission and letting the president get away with it, but uh, frequently it's through commission they actually legislate. Now, does that that should mean maybe what we ought to do then is just don't pay Congress any money and send them all home. You, you know, one, one time I made a suggestion, uh, of course, being in Congress, they thought this was self-serving. I thought we'd be better off we just paid everybody on the Hill about a million bucks if they promised they'd never come to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not so true anymore because this, this place is on autopilot. You know, it's just going no matter what. I mean, the presidents will do whatever they want and the courts will do whatever they want. Uh, these uh, small little banks called the uh, Federal Reserve System, they do whatever they want. They create all the money that they want. They create trillions of dollars and they don't have any responsibility to tell anybody uh, what they're doing. So that could be a little bit funny, but it's not funny because uh, the government is just going on and on. But what does Congress do 
if they're giving the power, all this power to the president? Uh, what do they spend their time on? Well, they're, they're doing all the things they shouldn't be doing. They fail to do the things that they should. Instead, they get to give that power to the president. The president does what he wants. And then uh, the th things that Congress comes up with, they're, they're passing out more funds. Used to be they'd collect money, you know, and then borrow a little bit. And then they'd have this political football game over there. And uh, who, got, who got the most money for their district? And that's how they, they would get reelected. But it doesn't even require that anymore. I mean, how much of this money that has been committed here in the uh, last six months has come through a legal process, and it, it, it's almost hardly any. You know, the 700 billion, that's just peanuts, compared to the eight trillion. We've committed eight trillion dollars. Well, where does this authority come? Is this presidential authority? Well, indirectly, uh, but uh, that's another branch of government, which is the, the Federal Reserve, and they, and they do all this funding, and, um, and, and, and government never, never slows up. But the, uh, the president uh, has had uh, way, way uh, too much power, and, um, and it looks like uh, it's going to continue. But why does the Congress do this? Well, I think it's a reflection of the educational system. I think the education in the last hundred years has just been disastrous, and uh, they believe it as a principle that this is a patriotic thing. This is, you know, a constitutional thing to do because it's proper. And uh, besides, the Constitution is not rigid; it's flexible and it has to adapt to, you know, modern times. So, let me tell you, they don't lose any sleep over that. I mean, and they, and they really feel like they're doing the Lord's work by allowing the presidents these prerogatives uh, to go out and do things more quickly uh, than if you had to go through Congress. You go, you send it through Congress uh, at times so the congressman gets some credit, you know, so that he can go back home and say that he had uh, something to do with this. One of, one of the uh, transferring of power is ongoing. This is rather small compared to the war powers, but it's this whole issue of, uh, of, of earmarks. Uh, we have a bunch of people, conservatives, that this is their whole issue, is we have to outlaw earmarks. Well, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We steal the money, and now we're passing it out. We ought, to tell, we ought to have the right to tell people where it's going to go. But no, there's not to be any earmarks. The money, if, if you vote against an earmark, it means that the money goes to the executive branch, and the executive branch just decides it doesn't cut any money. But people just live and die on this to punish the people who won't vote, uh, who will vote for, uh, for earmarks. Uh, but to me, the way I handle that is I vote for the principle that Congress should earmark and take the responsibility of where this money go, whether it's foreign or, or domestic. But then when the bill is finally passed or it finally comes up for, for vote, uh, vote against the bill because they shouldn't be dealing with any of that money whatsoever and they've overstepped their bounds. But uh, that will surely not stop uh, the expansion of the power uh, of, of the uh, presidency. But this, uh, this presidency and this executive uh, uh, branch of government these past eight years, uh, I, I consider it is absolute disaster. I mean, when it comes to signing statements, I mean, I mean this is just flaunt, I mean, flaunting it right in our face and say, you know, I'm going to uh, look at this and one half of this I don't like and I have no intention of following it. I mean, why do they even do that other than to establish the fact that they are king? I mean, they could just ignore it anyway. They do that all the time, or they interpret it any way they want, but they sign these statements. And they say, we're not even going to pay any attention to this. And then they come up with executive orders. You know, some executive orders, in my opinion, are, are proper, proper to execute the proper role of government. I mean, if, if, uh, if Congress declares war and you're in a war, the president would certainly have the authority to uh, have an executive order. But it would be very, very limited not to, uh, not to do the kind of things that they've done. I mean, it, Roosevelt, on a, an executive order, decided to call in the gold you know, and, and uh, steal the gold from the people. And uh, it was a uh, rubber stamp by the Congress, but there's some very outrageous things by executive order. So a truly constitutional president would be very, very rarely using an executive order. And uh, 
other than maybe a clarification, a signing statement, say this is a little bit, bit confusing and I don't know what you uh, mean by this. But you know, these things we do hear a little bit of talk about the executive orders and the signing statements and conservatives and libertarians have made uh, comments about this. But, but nobody really talks seriously about the whole principle of the executive branch of government when it comes to the agencies, when it comes to the administrative courts. From my viewpoint, they're all unconstitutional. The, the laws of the land should be written by the Congress, not by the executive branch. And then Congress writes the law, it goes into the executive branch, there might be a little bit of squabble, then there's a court ruling, and all of a sudden uh, you, you have these uh, wetland type bills. I know that's an example of where it got to the courts, and it's, it's magnified tenfold over what the original intent of the Congress was. The Congress shouldn't have done it in the first place, but then they do it and they say there's a little bit of regulation. Then it gets into the executive branch and rubber stamp by the courts, and uh, it's the law of the land. Uh, so it, uh, there, there seems to be no slowing up whatsoever. And uh, it, it it's, uh, looks like the people are asleep. Uh, the Congress is enjoying their way until, until maybe someday, maybe someday we'll have a financial crisis come. <laughs> and then they'll say, well, maybe we've gone in the wrong direction. Maybe we're spending too much. Oh, yeah, that's true. About a year ago, it was noticed that we were having some financial problems. And this financial problems, yeah, it came from government was too big. Government was spending too much. Government was borrowing too much. Government was printing too much. Oh, so what, what should we do? Well, we should spend more, borrow more, print more money, and give the government more power. Uh, so it, it's endless. But, um, you know, in, in spite of uh, the pessimism that tends to exist for those of us who believe in true liberty and are associated with, uh, with the government, uh, Actually, I've come away after this past year and a half or so as being a lot more optimistic uh, because of groups like the Independent Institute. They've been around, they're quiet, but they get information out and they're teaching, and this is what changes things. I think compared, uh, David mentioned I had run for uh, presidency twice, uh, and uh, the conditions, there are various, there were several variables compared to 1988 and now, 20, 20 years later, but there is a difference with the people. I mean, the people are the, especially the young people, they know what's going on. They know they're getting ripped off. They know this monetary system is, is a funny money system, and they know the burden is going to fall on them, and they are ripe for the pickings right now for people who will present the case for true liberty. I think what, uh, uh, what uh, we need to do is present the truth. And that, that is why uh, what Ivan's done has just been great. Because it will que make the people question, they're questioning the government, they need to question our history. And all this stuff we get from our public school system is, has just so misled us. So we really have an opportunity now for people who are uh, opening their eyes. One thing that has hap happened during the campaign was that we did get a support and enthusiasm from a lot of young people. And uh, once uh, that race ended, which was uh, in June, we still had a lot of momentum and we are still doing things to try to keep that momentum going. But a lot of young people, you know, well, what are they going to do? And a lot of, guess where they went? They went and worked for Obama. And they still see Believe me, I see a lot of people and I see a lot of overlapping. And, uh, you know, Obama's for change. Yeah, I certainly was for a lot of change, too. But uh, it means there's still a lot of confusion out there. And a lot of people who are young people who are with Obama with a little, a little bit more education are going to understand what true liberty uh, is all about. As far as assessment of what to come uh, with the next uh, administration, it's more of the same. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit scary uh, because uh, some of the anti-war uh, individuals coming from the Democratic side and the liberal side have been neutralized and they think that uh, Obama really wants change and he's gonna stand up and there will be a change in our foreign policy right now. 
I don't see it. I don't see him arguing the case that he wants to be president because he wants to do less for us, he, that he wants to, you to have more control of your life and more control of your dollars, and that we will uh, back off on our intervention uh, on our empire around the world. But what is coming, though, and why the work that we, we do and the work uh, that the Independent Institute does is so critical right now is because uh, we are in the midst of a major sea change in attitudes in this country. It's been happening, and I think because of the last 20 years we've made great progress. One of the individuals that influenced me a lot was uh, Leonard Reed. But he held the Ford for a long time, essentially by himself. But there's a lot of activity going on now. So there's room for, uh, to, there's, there's room for optimism. But it's very important that we keep this momentum going. If we do, we can have some victories. And we can once again uh, rec reclaim our Constitution. And maybe a few more members of Congress who will understand what taking the oath of office really means. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Our third speaker is Richard Shankman, who, as I mentioned, is the founder and editor of George Mason University's History News Network. He's associate professor of history at George Mason. He's a fellow of the Society of American Historians, and an Emmy Award-winning investigative reporter. He's been a producer and writer for numerous programs on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, and Learning Channel. He's the author of six New York Times best-selling books in history educated at Vassar and Harvard University. He has studied the American presidents for two decades, including working on the papers of Andrew Jackson. Rick. Following Ron Paul is not a good idea. It's like following a dog show that, you know, really won over people. I'm going to take a slightly more academic approach here. The uh, bad news is I'm going to risk boring you in the interest of trying to put uh, the rating of presidents into historical context. The good news is I may fail, and perhaps despite my best efforts, you'll actually find some of this interesting. Amongst ourselves, historians have always secretly been grateful to Warren Harding. While we often struggle to assess other presidencies, you could always count on Harding being dead last. This was a great comfort. Now comes Ivan along to tell us that we cannot even have this soup son of confidence. Harding on his list comes in six. <laughs> Our president must have heard of Ivan's new assessment. It accounts for his indifference to public discontent. If a Harding, that slob in Alice Roosevelt's fine jab, can rise, then most certainly there's hope for himself. And Bush, as far as we know, never kept a mistress on the side. What I want to focus on is talking about this business of rating the presidents as a parlor game. You hear that all the time. I want to take issue with that. In a parlor game, there are rules. In cards, you can count the joker or you can't. In charades, you cannot speak a word without incurring a penalty. In checkers and chess, you must move the pieces in certain ways and not in others. Rating presidents is an altogether different type of game. There are no rules. Should we count what a president does in his private life or not? Do we give him credit as an orator if someone else writes his speeches or not? Do we penalize him if he happens to have siblings like Billy Carter who are always getting into trouble or not? Part of the fun of the presidential ratings game is that there are no rules. It is this astonishing freedom from the bounds of ordinary conventions, this freedom to say anything we want about the presidents. For example, that Ronald Reagan is the greatest president in United States history, Gallup poll, February 2001, that makes this game so irresistible. Furthermore, it is relentlessly democratic. A perfect game for our times. One need know nothing. I mean this almost literally in order to play the game. You do not have to be a historian to have an opinion about the presidents. Soon as you step forth in this world and cry out for your mama, you are entitled in America to your opinion about the people who have run this country. This fact gives this game an aspect of ridiculousness that one does not associate with parlor games like chess or checkers. 
This is why I insist that rating precedents is not a parlor game. No self-respecting parlor game could survive for long under these circumstances. In effect, we treat checkers with more seriousness than we do presidential ratings. What does this say about us? I think that it suggests the unseriousness with which we often approach politics. This is not to say that rating presidents is unseriousness. It is just the way that we have done so. Can we actually rate presidents? Let us ask that most fundamental of questions. Consider Ronald Reagan, for example. Reagan is known, of course, as the president who helped reshape our country and the world by becoming a spokesman for the free enterprise system. No other president, save possibly for Calvin Coolidge, a Reagan hero, incidentally, uh, exalted capitalism with as much gusto as the former official spokesman for General Electric, Ronald Reagan. But how shall we assess his contribution? I heard historian Vijay Brachad at Trinity, from Trinity College at a conference over this weekend, the American Historical Association meeting up in New York, trace the history of Islamist fundamentalism in Pakistan to the decision of the International Monetary Fund in the early 1980s to force the government there to abandon its expensive health care program for the poor. At the time, the IMF's decision was regarded by conservatives as a necessary reform for flabby, socialistic countries. But what was the result in Pakistan and elsewhere in the region was that the demolition of health care programs left health care up to faith-based organizations like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the radical groups in Pakistan. This gave Islamists a striking opportunity, and they have made, I'm sad to say, the most of it. Now, no one would argue that radical Islamism is wholly the effect of Ronald Reagan's free enterprise rhetoric. That would be silly. But his rhetoric had unintended consequences, as did his support of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Did Reagan understand this? Have we understood this? And once we do, how do we factor it into our assessment of his presidency? Can we be sure he is still a great president? Are presidents responsible for the forces their own actions unleash? Are they to be held accountable for what comes afterward? Should we hold Calvin Coolidge responsible for the Great Depression, which began under his successor's watch? One of the most striking things to me about the categories we use to evaluate presidents is how familiar they are. Great, near great, not so great, good, bad. We could be rating baseball players except that we measure ball players with far more precision than we do presidents. When rating pitchers, for example, we base our tally on statistics that measure their performance precisely. We know how many balls, strikes, and errors they had, and then add up the numbers to arrive at a judgment. With presidents, we have no such precise measurements. This is no accident as it happens. We have a vital need to use a loose matrix because it is democratic. If we used a methodology that was more precise, we would perforce have to use a grammar and vocabulary that goes beyond the grasp of ordinary voters. And this would defeat the purpose. What is the purpose? We do not usually ask ourselves this question. It seems self-evident to us that we should establish a hierarchy among the presidents. We should rank them for the same reason we rank ball players. It just seems natural. I would submit that there is actually a very good reason for ranking presidents, and it goes far beyond some ordinary human inclination to arrive at an order of things. It is to give us an idea of ourselves. The ranking of presidents is ultimately not about them. It is about us. It is about who we are and what values we cherish. In this, we have a great stake. History, unfortunately, is an extraordinarily messy neighborhood. There are not just good folks and bad folks, people who live in the good part of town and people who live across the railroad tracks on the bad side of town. There are good people who do bad things and bad people who do good things. And there are many people who simply drift. How they all interact in the world they make is therefore very complicated. This is why making sense of the past is difficult. It is to rescue us from this confusion that we rank presidents. Here at our fingertips is a way of making sense of the past and ourselves and with very little effort, it would seem. It is, of course, a delusion. History is not so neat and simple. It is not filled with good guys and bad guys. Presidents do not, do not ride into town on a white horse and clean things up. 
Ronald Reagan did not win the Cold War any more than FDR won World War II. Presidents do not shape history so much as be shaped by it. As Abraham Lincoln admitted in 1864, at the height of his near dictatorial powers, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. At the heart of presidential rankings, therefore, is an assumption that is at the very least highly debatable. It is this. It is the belief that we truly learn something about ourselves by forcing presidents into the little boxes on our flowcharts of history. Take Reagan again. When we talk about his legacy, we consider a rather narrow spectrum of events. Traded arms for hostages, check. Bolstered the military, check. Lowered taxes, check. Increased the deficit, check. But did he win the Cold War? And what if he did? How do we assess his presidency if one of the unintended consequences of his presidency was to bolster the very forces that led to the rise of Islamist radicalism? What is victory? Is it victory when the seeds of an ensuing disaster, 9-11 say, are sown in a previous victory? How inadequate our little check boxes seem when we confront these rather large questions. This brings me back to Ivan's book. One of the main reasons I like Ivan Elin's book and wanted to be on this panel is that it demonstrates in its fiercely consistent and courageous way how limited our system of category categorizing presidents actually is. Ivan forces us, even as he employs a system of measurement, to beware of, of such measurement systems. The very strangeness of many of his results, which he himself admits, John Tyler coming in first, Warren Harding coming in sixth, suggests that the outcome of any rating system is determined by the means of measurement. This is no simple parlor game after all, it turns out. Upon reflection, measuring presidents raises questions rather than answering them. It is this that makes me most grateful to Ivan. I submit that we cannot resist playing the ratings game. I love to do it just as much as anybody. But after Ivan, we will never play the game the same way we have in the past. I know that I won't. For what Ivan has done is to help us see through the pretensions of rating systems. In particular, it breaks the grip the Schlesinger system has had over our imagination. An ax had to be taken to that old system. Ivan has wielded it expertly. No longer will anyone be able to pretend that historians sitting in judgment on Mount Olympus are able to decide who deserves to go into which category. Much as we would like to stand outside history, we cannot do so. You see, it is not only presidents who are human, but even we historians. They are not gods and neither are we. It would make life easier if we were. Then we could settle once and for all the question of presidential rankings and rest in the knowledge that we had made sense of an untidy world. Alas, the world remains untidy. We simply have to learn to live with that. Thank you. So we have time for some questions, and if uh, you'll just wait for the microphone, this gentleman right here, and if, uh, just make it a short question and indicate who it's addressed to. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to address this question to Ivan. You talked about Theodore Roosevelt, and I know uh, Article 1, Section 8 gives, gives the Congress the right to make war, but you, you mentioned Osama bin Laden. How do you know that Vladimir Putin does not have control over the September 11th attack because the... Um, uh, September 11th Commission, dominated by the Council on Foreign Relations members, never investigated, uh, uncovered his spies for that, and, and the uh, uh, tyrants in Cuba have just celebrated their 50th anniversary. So if you were a freshman in Congress, what would you do to investigate Putin, and what would you do about the Castro brothers, which, which Roosevelt, he had, I know he had a uh, Monroe Doctrine corollary. So what would you do? Well, I'm not much into conspiracy theories, I guess, but... Um, I think uh, overall we need to take, uh, you know, we've had these uh, threats around for a long time, so-called threats, and uh, I think we need to uh, process uh, how we think about foreign countries. We think uh, automatically overseas 
when something happens, uh, we think that uh, you know somebody did something to us or somebody could do something to us, and we never really <clears throat> examine our own behavior because there's a history of of uh, U.S. actions that may have contributed. Uh, certainly not I'm not blaming 9/11 on on U.S. people, but the, the United Osama bin Laden's main uh, main gripe with the United States is that uh, we were occupying Saudi Arabia and other Muslim lands with non-Muslim forces. This is a problem throughout the world. It's the problem in Palestine. It's the problem in Chechnya. It's the problem in, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan. And uh, so we need, to, we need to examine ourselves before we examine other countries. And I think uh, we would find that the, the, con the situations are much more complex than our politicians uh, tell us. Uh, and so uh, I don't think we should look for imaginary threats overseas, and I don't think we should uh, ma magnify uh, the threats that we see. Uh, we're a very intrinsically secure country. Uh, we have two huge moats, and we have weak and friendly neighbors. And since 1945, we have the biggest uh, atomic arsenal ever assembled. And n there's nobody that's going to attack us conventionally. Uh, the only thing we have to fear is terrorism. Well, we're ginning a lot of this stuff up by stirring the hornet's nest, so we're creating our own threat there. So I don't think we should go trooping around like Don Quixote, and I think a lot of this, uh, this Iraq, well, in, in the case of Iraq, what if Saddam, nobody ever asked this question in the debate for the war, what if Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapon? Would that necessarily be a threat to the United States? Well, of course, oh, this is a threat to the United States. But North Korea now has several nuclear weapons, and we haven't invaded that country. So, and Iran is close. Are we going to invade them? Uh, other countries we've deterred in the past. We deterred Mao when he had a nuclear weapon, and he actually indirectly threatened to nuke the United States. I think he was worse than probably the Iranians, the North Koreans. Uh, he was very radical when he first uh, took over. And so uh, we can't uh, get involved in imaginary threats or magnifying threats because this is really what drives big government. And I think conservatives really need to realize that the warfare state uh, preceded the welfare state. And, uh, uh, you know, there's no secret that uh, LBJ, uh, Nixon, Reagan, and George Bush are the biggest uh, spending presidents that we've had. Uh, LBJ and Nixon had a long war, Vietnam. And uh, uh, Bush has got the long war on terror, and Reagan uh, increased defense spending uh, because he imagined that the Soviet threat was somehow increasing when it was actually decreasing. So uh, I don't think we should get involved in conspiracy theories or that sort of thing. Okay. I have two questions for the panel, for whoever wants to answer. <clears throat> We have been told that uh, the intelligence justifying the attack on Iraq was invented. But what is very unusually told the public by our press is that we got this intelligence. The men of science working for Saddam Hussein wanted to get his favors. So they exaggerated what they were having and they were telling him that they were about to get the atomic bomb and other weapons of mass destruction. And that's the intelligence we gathered. But what we didn't, we were not able to see is that the scientists in Iraq were deceiving Haram Hussein. Now, the second question is this. In Afghanistan, ladies, women, were nothing. They were not even able to study. Now they are massively going to education, massively, in, in, Iran, in Afghanistan. And there is, under the circumstances, a, way, a, a kind of democracy in Afghanistan. And in Iraq, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of newspapers, radio stations, uh, free press, absolutely, and we have been trying to reconciliate, to put together the Shiites and the Sunnis. Can we understand that as progress? Those are my two questions. Thank you. 
Who wants to take that? <laughs> Ron, do you want to take that? Well, I, I, I can try to address that, but uh, on... Hmm? Is this, is this the one? Yeah, it's on. Okay. It's on. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the issue of uh, how, we, how Saddam Hussein was uh, deceived, I think it relates back to something that Ivan just got done saying. What if, they, what if we knew they did have a weapon? Their, their deception is their problem. But uh, I, was, I had to decide a, a vote on this. And that, uh, some people come up to me and they said, boy, you were pretty smart in not believing our government and all this propaganda that we heard. Well, I didn't believe it. I didn't think they had a weapon. Uh, but that wasn't the reason I voted against it. It was the fact that Saddam Hussein was not a threat. He didn't have an army. He didn't have an air force. He didn't have a navy. And if he had a single little bomb, it still wasn't a threat. So to, to me, it was almost irrelevant. I, generally can't say that, but uh, that is the truth, uh, because they weren't, they weren't uh, a, a direct uh, threat to us. And uh, what, what was your, the second part, just briefly? The second question is the achievements we got in Afghanistan, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. He, he, and the achievements in Iraq, hundreds if not thousands of newspapers, radio stations, and... Yeah, well... I have a hard time looking at anything positive coming out of Afghanistan or Iraq, yeah. because what I was thinking about when you were mentioning that, but yeah, but at what cost? If uh, and and I've seen some Afghan women interviewed on this, and they're not nearly as, as hysterical about what they used to have compared to what they have now. But it's a tremendous cost. First, we shouldn't do it; it's none of our business. Second, we didn't have the money, and it cost a lot of money. And it cost a lot of lives. And besides, these wars are just beginning. I mean, we're in the midst of them. We're going to be brought to our knees. Uh, uh, Osama bin Laden is delighted with us there. You know, there was talk about, uh, you know, no terrorist attacks since 9-11. Uh, well, I think there's been plenty of attacks against us. And Obama made the statement, uh, uh, bin Laden made the statement that, you know, that you will be now on our sand and we'll be over there. We're right in their face. I mean, there's less of an incentive to come over here because they're there and they're undermining us and they wanted to financially bring us our, our ruin. So even if you can find a little bit here, you might say, well, maybe if we had done nothing, maybe if we had never interfered, there would have been a coup uh, and, and uh, Saddam Hussein had been killed and maybe the conditions would be 10 times better. So if you can come up with a couple token little improvements, uh, that, that to me doesn't, that does not even look even make me think for the slightest justification for, for our interventions. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, that reminded me of something, that this, pro, this idea that we've made progress in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I would compare it to the South during Reconstruction. Uh, uh, there's a general, who, uh, General Bunting, who wrote a book, I, kn I know the guy, and he wrote a book on Grant, so he's an expert on Reconstruction. And he, compla he uh, compares the Northern military occupation of the South to the Vietnam War. And he basically says, well, the North won the war and the South won the peace. So what happened was after the Civil War, they went down there with armies and they made the South even madder than they were of having lost the war and, undergo and having undergone Sherman's scorched earth ta tactics, which were really war crimes and that sort of thing. But what happened was as long as the Union forces were there, uh, there was progress. But when the Union forces <coughs> left, and, and of course, the North got tired. There was a recession, a panic of 17, 1873, which is what they called deep recessions back then. Uh, and of course, nobody in the North, everybody got tired of the Reconstruction. It's just like Vietnam. The U.S. went in, we do what we do, and then we got tired and we went home. Well, the North, there was no stomach in the North for continuing this. And of course, what happened was, and there's a new book out that details this. It's called The Reenslavement of Blacks After the Civil War. Uh, because they were, they had black codes, they forced the former slaves to work on the same ground for a pittance. They arrested uh, African Americans, and they uh, have, find them heavily, and then they made them work off the the uh, uh, the fine. And then, of course, we had the Jim Crow laws. So you can say really that the Civil War probably didn't end, or, or the the Reconstruction and the, the well, I should say the second class citizens of blacks certainly didn't end until the 1960s. So. Uh, the same thing is in, uh, true in Afghanistan and Iraq. You're going to see uh, what looks like progress, but it, we're holding our finger in the dike. And as soon as we um, pull the finger out, 
uh, all that progress is going to evaporate probably, and we're going to go back to uh, if the, and if it's anything like Somalia, uh, U.S. meddling has increased the um, radicalism in the Islamist. Uh, community. So Som Somalia, when the Ethiopians leave, is probably going to descend into worse uh, nightmare because the U.S. has been uh, meddling in there. And I think you have to watch it in these countries that you may get something worse than you have. The progress is very illusory in many of these places. Uh, yes, this is for Dr. Eland. Um, I believe that you said that uh, your number one rated president was uh, John Tyler, um, although he was never really elected, I believe. Um, and uh, I, but I think Grover Cleveland was in your top five, uh, maybe. He's number two. He's number two. Okay, and he was elected twice in eight years. Um, what what to, in this in in t today where we see uh, Senator, I mean uh, President-elect Obama being compared to. Uh, uh, FDR and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln. What, what do you think that our, our, our next president could learn from a Grover Cleveland? What, what makes him being ranked number two in your, in your, uh, in your uh, Well, that's list? a good question. I mean, Grover Cleveland may have been our most honest president, but that's not why I rated him number two, because uh, personal honesty is good, but I stuck to policy. And Grover Cleveland believed in limited government, uh, and the Democratic Party, up until Woodrow Wilson, uh, believed in small government. And he was a true Democrat in that sense. He made some mistakes. Uh, he wasn't perfect. Uh, but I think he, he uh, returned us to the gold standard. Uh, tight monet monetary policy. He was very fiscally conservative. He believed uh, he would get requests to uh, get behind a legislative bill. And he said, I didn't come here to legislate. And there were some very important things, like uh, r related to the currency, whether we should go uh, use silver coins, which actually increased the monetary supply, versus just sticking with the gold. And he was very passionate about that, but he refused, as a larger principle, to get involved in legislation. And now, how many presidents, uh, how long has it been since we saw that? I mean, now the president is expected to present a budget, is presented, expected to present legislation, and actively lobby for it to get it passed. But he believed uh, that the president should do what, exactly what the Constitution and have a, uh, a uh, limited role. And he was the last of a dying breed because the next president was William McKinley and that started the road on the road to very, William McKinley was a very important president and you hear almost nothing about him but if you go down to the pot belly sandwich store they have a big picture of him but I don't think it's because they admire him it's because they're trying to get the turn of the century flair but that's the only picture I've ever seen of William McKinley but he's a very important president because Grover Cleveland was the last of the uh, what I would say, restrained presidents. Now, even uh, Harding and Coolidge were restrained, but they, were, they never went back to the Grover Cleveland model. And so, and, and Harding and Coolidge, in my view, are, were pretty good presidents, but, but uh, uh, Cleveland stuck with the limited executive. He believed in a limited federal government, and uh, he believed in uh, tight money policy. You might add one thing to that, Ivan. He also was an anti-imperialist. Right, right, the Hawaii, yeah. yeah he refused was, uh, to annex issue. Hawaii because there was a the U.S. sponsored a coup there, and he realized that the Hawaiians didn't really want to be part of the United States at that time, and so he he declined to. Well, Benjamin Harrison had already submitted the treaty, and he withdrew it when he first when he came in. It's it's commonplace in Congress to have pictures on your walls when you're meeting with and shaking hands with the presidents that they have met. Uh, I have a picture of only one president in my office. It happens to be Grover Cleveland. And underneath it said, what is it worth if you get elected or reelected if you don't stand for anything? <laughs> there was a comment about reconstruction and a question for Dr. Uh, for Representative uh, Paul. Um, about reconstruction, I think it's vastly overstated the military aspect of reconstruction. Less than two years after Appomattox, the entire U.S. Army was less than 40,000 men. And most of that was in the West within two years of Appomattox. For Dr. Pa uh, Representative Paul, a question. Uh, given your <coughs> opposition to the Fed is unconstitutional, what do you think of the founding fathers, or many of them, having set up the Bank of the United States. 
which was involved in commercial banking, even more big, bigger than the Fed, and was written and was set up by Alexander Hamilton and signed into law by George Washington. So how could the Fed then be Yeah, I would have been on Jefferson's side. Sure. <laughs> because he, he objected to it. And, uh, and you... He didn't write the, he wasn't involved in writing the Constitution, George Washington. Yeah, but I mean, that's my position that, uh, you, oh, you're, you're arguing the case that they wrote the Constitution and they believe they could have it. Yeah. Yeah, and s s some of the founding fathers were good at, uh, in the theoretical sense, and when they became president, I mean Jefferson did uh, he did great thinking and theoretical thinking, but they weren't. He wasn't high on the list, you know, in Ivan's ra rating. So they 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 go about and do and do different things. But no, I think you you, you have to believe in uh, uh, you know Article One, Section Eight. If it's not there, you can't do it. And uh, I think uh, the courts certainly hurt us on that. You know, uh, McCullough versus Maryland, you know, set the stage for, for all of this. And he says, implied powers? Oh, yeah, you know, it's implied and necessary and proper. I mean, that drives me nuts. Well, you can write a law anything that's necessary and proper. Not, not for the authorities that are explicitly given to the Congress, but they still use this. They, they have a rule at the House that every time you write something, you're supposed to write down what part of the Constitution you got this authority. And they go, oh, the necessary and proper. This is necessary that uh, we do A, B, and C. And uh, has no relationship whatsoever to the explicit powers uh, granted. But they immediately uh, go off on a tangent, I think, and that's why you get these uh, mixed positions. Just as, an, uh, as a follow-up to what Ron was just saying, getting back to Thomas Jefferson, here's the, here's the main author of the Declaration of Independence and many other writings that deal with liberty, and yet, as Ivan discusses in his book, he shows that when, when Jefferson was in office, he did a whole number of things which were completely contrary to the principles he discussed. It, one of the exceptions was that he did abolish the first U.S. bank. Right. So that was in keeping with Jefferson's I think Ron would agree, view that the Constitution didn't authorize that. So question in the back. R.J. Smith, National Center for Public Policy Research. I'm a property rights, private property rights advocate, and I'd like to thank Dr. Paul for bringing up the issue of wetlands and property rights, uh, whereby Congressman Oberstar and Senator Feingold are trying to take the Clean Water Act which prohibited pollution of navigable waters, which means a boat can go up and down it, to regulating everybody's land in the United States because rainwater might carry something on your land off into a creek which would flow into a little river, go into a bigger river, and eventually end up into a navigable water. And when it comes to private property rights, I'd like to state that I think that George W. Bush was the second worst president in the United States, second only to Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt nationalized two-thirds of all the land in the western 13 states west of the 100th meridian and turned them over to the federal government. The fortunate thing was nobody lived on those lands, but it did lock up all those resources for the federal government. Are now you? what George W. Bush has done and uh, his henchmen in the Department of Interior is to come up with a lot of scams with nice sounding names like perpetual conservation easements and cooperative conservation programs which distinguish the line between private ownership and government ownership. Thank you. Okay. The gentleman right here in front. Yeah. My question my question is for Richard Schenkman. Uh, during the post convention campaign Illegal immigration was scarcely discussed, uh, to a large part thanks to the connivance of the debate moderators. And my question is this, in view of the meltdown and what have you, do you think that illegal immigration will be return as a, reemerge as a major issue, and if so, how soon? Well, that's interesting. Uh, some people are arguing that uh, the immigration uh, problem will almost uh, take care of itself now because there aren't going to be that many Mexicans who are eager to come to the United States and stand on the unemployment lines or stand around and be unemployed just like everybody else. So um, 
I know that already they're noticing a tremendous uh, drop in the traffic coming across the border, uh, both uh, legal and illegal. So it may just be uh, a problem that, that doesn't uh, materialize until we have prosperous times again, and then, and then we'll have to revisit it. Okay. One more question about the gentleman right here. This is for Congressman Ron Paul. Who in the Congress are you going to be able to, um, who are you going to be able to work most closely with to help solve our problems regarding the economy and, and our foreign policy? I think I understood the question, who else in the Congress can I work with on solving our problems? Yes. Well, I, in, in some ways it's everybody and nobody. Because uh, there's, there's nobody that fully has accepted the constitutional libertarian principle of uh, personal liberty, that is, is in my interpretation. So there, there are disagreements, but I work very closely with some very, very uh, left-wing Democrats and progressives, and, uh, and, and some of them are very, very principled on civil liberties and, uh, and on the war issue and some of the conservatives. Uh, Jeff Flake. Uh, probably votes with me the most on the economic issues, but uh, probably not on the civil liberties. But I notice, uh, you know, even on civil liberties, he's sort of shifting a little bit. So, and Walter Jones is a conservative, and he uh, he sort of has shifted gear. He voted for the war, but now he is adamantly opposed to this war. So there's a lot of shifting. And <clears throat> I just try to work with anybody who will, <laughs> who will pay any attention. And, uh, and, and looking forward to a, a few new ones coming in, but uh, there's, uh, there's, there's no one little group, although I do have a group uh, called the Liberty Caucus, and we bring, bring together, and there might be 10 or 12, and there's some liberal, moderate Republicans. Most of the time, they're Republicans. Uh, sometimes Democrats show up. And then there's mostly conservatives, but they, um, uh, th they, they just come together on different issues. And even this week, I had... Uh, uh, you, you know, I was. Uh, at, we had somebody testifying from SEC dealing with the Madoff scandal, and uh, the scream now is for more regulation, more regulation. Like uh, we had the SEC, you know, in the Depression, and it didn't solve the problem. We had Enron, and so we had Sarbanes-Oxley, and that didn't solve the problem. Now we have another Madoff scandal. Now we're going to have more regulations, and I tried to make this point, really making points to the far left. You know, why is it that you understand that we don't want to regulate personal behavior and uh, teach people how to live and take care of their lives and uh, we don't get involved in religious matters and, uh, and a lot of bad things happen from religion and philosophical reasons. We, we allow that to occur in the press. What do we do with the press? We don't have prior restraint and just think, you know, in the paper they libel us and slander us and they do all these kind of things. But all of a sudden they throw their hands up and they say, Every single economic transaction has to be regulated, trying to bring that together. And, you know, that I, I couldn't even have made that argument 10 or 15 years ago. They probably would have shut me down quicker. But now they're paying a little bit more attention. So there is no three or four or five that's exactly. But uh, I, I really, in a very serious way, way believe that uh, the freedom philosophy is adaptable to everybody across the spectrum. It's just that I'd like to get them more to think it's worthwhile to be consistent. The Constitution is far from uh, perfect, uh, but I believe in the rule of law and we ought to do our best to follow. If we don't like it, we, we, we should change it. And fortunately, I do believe that the uh, Constitution is uh, fairly libertarian and freedom loving and uh, if we would just interpret it that way. and. I'm reassured. They all took their oath yesterday, so we're off and running. <laughs> Rick, yes. Yeah, that, that small uh, Liberty Caucus of yours of uh, 10 or 12 people, uh, your, your problem is uh, your timing. Uh, a, a century ago, you would have had uh, a lot more uh, members in that Liberty Caucus, but something happened, and that was the 1930s and the Great Depression and liberty was redefined. Up until then, liberty was defined in terms of natural liberty. Beginning in the 1930s, it began being defined as what we now call, political scientists call, programmatic liberty. In other words, programs to help people live a better lives, and that's the welfare and social security and all those other programs we associate with the New Deal. And one thing to keep in mind is that it was the Great Depression which changed that definition of liberty in American culture. And 
we are now on the edge of another possible depression. So if anything, the pressure is going to be to make your caucus even smaller because the, the worst times, the worst uh, things get, the more people are going to demand government action. Well, in, in many ways, I, I work with trying to uh, be optimistic about it. And in, in a, I'm not in, trying to just throw a wet in, blanket in a way, on you. Yes, in, in a way, though, <laughs> uh, you, you used fancier terms that I usually talk about uh, a while back. I, I don't always say uh, the depression, but somewhere along the way, a hundred years ago or so, we divided, we chopped the freedom into two pieces, economic liberty and personal liberty. And of course, my goal was to put it all back together. And believe me, I talk a whole lot about that, and the college kids understand this. They understand personal liberty and economic <laughs> issues, uh, liberty, and uh, when I talk to them, I tell them, look, if you want your freedom, and you mess up. Don't come crawl into the government to bail us out or take care of you. The responsibility is on you. And they do understand that things aren't going quite well and they know they can't depend on the government anymore. The government they've given up on, Social Security is not going to be there for the college kids and they know that. But I think we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one thing I might just add also about this whole issue of the recession and the, uh, the huge bailouts and the Fed's credit expansions and so on and so forth, um, the, the zeitgeist, the, the, the reigning view of an age um, has been that government is the solution to almost everything. But the, the traditional Keynesian view of managing an economy uh, through government spending and deficits and all the rest of it um, is one that a growing number of economists challenge. They challenge the orthodox view that the New Deal uh, end of the Great Depression, the view among many of these scholars is that these New Deal measures prolonged and deepened the Great Depression and it was the little guy who paid for it. And that's, that's the, the, uh, the issue that needs to come through, is that people have to realize that um, political power is uh, done in the name of interest groups for their own benefit. And they seek to sort of uh, spin a fog uh, to, to um, delude people into believing that it's in their interest. So um, I want to thank our three speakers. If you join me, in a round of applause. Um, copies of Ivan's book are available, and uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to autograph copies. I want to uh, thank again uh, Congressman Paul. He has to, to bolt. But um, thank you all for coming in with us, and we hope that you'll join with us at our next event. Good night.